Greetings, how are you? Um, it is, I'm sure it's been said to you, but it's great to see so many people here. And I mean, we're not in Tulsa or Milwaukee. I mean, this is amazing to see so many folks interested in ag here in Boston, which I think is saying something about Boston, what all of you are doing. So let's get into ethics. I am so uncomfortable with ethic discussions because I used to work for Richard Nixon at the end of his life, and I, I was the first director of the Nixon Center. But it does raise an interesting question out of the foreign policy area. In, in foreign policy and national security, we have, we have foreign policy realists, and realists tend not to get lost in sentiment and heart and hope. Uh, and you've got uh, foreign policy idealists who want to carve the world to make the world in a better way and, 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 and to have justice and and empowerment, self-determination. And so there's sort of an interesting tension around that. I'm interested in whether in the ag area and in the innovation area, uh, and EC, I know you're not an ag person, but you are uh, involved in other key ethics issues around this, whether or not there's evolving a kind of tension over innovation idealism and innovation realism. Mm. Uh, and let me start with you, EC, because I know you work with CRISPR, and CRISPR is right in the middle of a lot of this. That's right. That wasn't my choice to get involved with ag. It's just happened this way. Um, when the Atlantic calls. <laughs> no, it's not the Atlantic, it's CRISPR. Um, when, we, when we first started working with CRISPR and, and, and thinking about how, what the impact of CRISPR on the world, we were thinking all biomedical applications because we're a biomedical research institute. Human therapeutics, how it does it impact human health and research. But then the ag company started calling. It says, well, we want to use it for ag. I said, well, what do you do in ag? <laughs> Why do you need CRISPR? And this is when I started learning about the ag and the component and the potential of CRISPR in ag and increasing yields, drought resistance, um, and the potentials may be hopefully changing many, many lives if you can bring uh, seeds to Africa that would not be as fragile as, as mm -hmm. those today. The question is, how? How do you structure two things? One is how do you structure the right framework for disseminating CRISPR to the world to enable ag? And that's talking about the licensing framework. There's ethics involved with that because do you want it in as many hands as possible? Do you want to give it exclusively to one player who will invest more and so forth? And the second one, because we don't understand ag, we were worried about what does the license need to include. For example, in human therapeutics, we know that we don't allow for germline editing because we don't want to create uh, genetic changes that will go through generations. And as we're working through this, the thinking about how do we license in ag, uh, Eric Glender comes to my office and says, so what is it? that we need to worry about in ag. Like, I know we worry about germline editing. Is there something similar in ag? It says, I have no clue. I grew up in Tel Aviv. I know nothing about ag. Yeah. <laughs> so then we started having the conversations. What are the ethics associated with the ag licenses? And who regulates it? And do they understand the science? Should we worry that they don't understand the science? And therefore, we should put restrictions in those? And, and we started thinking about those issues. And we did end up doing certain restrictions in our ag licenses. We can get into But this, this was later. sort of self done. Emily, I know you're a lawyer. Do you trust self regulators? Um, this guy? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I'm, I'm sort of, as we see the evolving science and impact, it raises interesting. You're talking about germline, you know, germline, and I know, I don't know if it's CRISPR, but mm -hmm. I know that, say, for instance, in certain kinds of mosquitoes and radiate related, we're thinking about That's actually right. uh, affecting the germline of a, of a, 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 a species of, of, of insect, right? So we're, 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 we're engaging in things that five years ago would have been so over the ethical line as described then, I think. Uh, and, it, and it made me kind of think about, you know, when, when, when a lot of these innovations were coming on, we began to sort of have uh, articles, not in the Atlantic, but in, 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 in other publications on designer babies and what you could do. And it made me begin thinking about designer crops, designer corn, which is what you're doing, designer wheat, right. designer others in which, you know, those things are possible. And so he just said that they be, they've, they've kind of initiated their own uh, restraint, if, if you will, and you work as a lawyer thinking about food regulation. Mm -hmm. um, how comfortable are you leaving it to the party doing the innovating to do the regulating? Well, so I think there's, there's a couple pieces of it. One piece, it gets to this issue that law is sort of always playing a game of catch up. Because we write, we write our regulations around food, around other things at a time where we're looking at farms, like we talked about, you know, what you think of as a farm, and we're regulating farms, and then we think the product of that farm gets packaged, and it's food, and what does the labeling look like? 
And I think there's just fundamental changes going on. And what we've seen is that our agencies that regulate food don't have good processes in place to do this. So it's it's heartening to see, you know, the institution coming up with its own ideas of here's the ways we want these to be used, here's the restrictions. Um, and it's great to hear about them being so thoughtful. Um, but I think it, there's also this question of now when these agencies get their act together, what mm -hmm. are they going to say? Is it going to be the same or different? Um, so, um, Is there a good statutory framework out there for evolving science? No, there's really not. Um, and I, I would say I'm, I, I, hate, I hesitate to say in this current political era we need a new statute and we're going to get something really great passed. <laughs> but we really just don't have a good solution. Think um, long term. Yeah, right. And, and, you know. um, but if you look back in the 80s when we first started trying to figure out regula regulation for uh, genetic engineering, we, mm. we sort of said, we're not going to create new legislation. Our agencies can just handle this. But the explosion of innovation, of new techniques, of questions of not just when you're looking at changes to seeds, but also changes in animals, uh, you know, who gets mm -hmm. to call the shots on that? And, and it's really unclear right now. Bob, I want to get to you in a second on feeding the world, but I just, I, I want to <laughs> go back to this patent thing for a minute. Uh, one of the Atlantic cover stories that we published, I don't know, 15 years ago, it was a long time ago, had to do with the Bayh-Dole Act. And I don't know if people are fitting, it's probably too wonky for you, but the Bayh-Dole Act essentially helped universities make money out of the innovations to create new partnerships, to license technology, and to take a share uh, uh, in this. And it, and it was um, purported to have been part of this incredible innovation boom based at universities and helped promote a lot of partnerships with industry. One of the downsides of it, particularly with you know, the case that, that uh, uh, the particular Jennifer Washburn was looking at was Alzheimer's rats, all, rats used in Alzheimer's, that there were certain things they were discovering and that as companies were engaged with universities, they didn't want that, that those discoveries shared with their rivals. And so it began to diminish the commons. You began to sort of take the scientific commons and create market enclosures. And I, you see, when you were talking, that all just came flooding back to me, that, that piece from 15 years ago, because you seem to, what you and uh, the Broad Foundation, what MIT and Harvard are trying to do, is to break a logjam. And I found that very interesting, that you want to say, hey, we don't want to have this. You're going to put patents out. If, if folks don't know, they've made an agreement to put patents out for free, to take one of the licensees and to compel them to, to create non-exclusivity exclusivity and patents. So it, are you worried that in this evolving area that it's already getting too chopped up, too yes. stuck in ownership struggles? Yes, that's exactly what was the concern in the ag space and CRISPR. Um, as I said, we're thinking about... So why don't you give people a quick profile, because they may not have read the yes. 47 pages I did on it. <laughs> uh. mm -hmm. um, so first, to your first point, yes, absolutely, we worry about... And this thing just I know. Spilled. It's always the left ear is a problem. Uh. So we have extensive discussions internally what type of technology should be licensed exclusive, exclusively versus right. non-exclusively our default is non-exclusive licensing unless certain technologies like a specific therapeutic that we know that if you license non-exclusively basically is a death sentence to this technology because nobody will invest and the buyer people can tell you how much it costs to make right. a drug it's in the billions of dollars. Nobody will invest that, that amount of money to make a drug unless they get it exclusively. But where is the line? Therapeutics clearly needs exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Research tools clearly should not be licensed exclusively. And what you talk about, the Alzheimer mouse, is a research tool. That should never be licensed exclusively in, in our view. And you're correct, certain institutions do license those type of technologies exclusively, and this is similar to what happened a little bit with CRISPR. So when we thought about the licensing framework for CRISPR, we spent a lot of time thinking about the different applications of that technology. And basically we said it's a non-exclusive for research and for all applications other than the application as a therapeutic in people. And by the way, this one is also should be limited. The exclusivity should be limited in this application so other entities can come in and develop therapeutics as well. So this is the framework, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this and negotiating this with the investors of the company we started and with the entities who wanted to take licenses because everybody wants exclusivity. Monsanto comes in, they want exclusivity. Pioneer comes in, they want exclusivity. Sanjanta wants exclusivity. Everybody wants it. But then that means you give the technology to a single entity. We thought it's a bad idea. We did non-exclusive. 
there is there are some foundational claims in another institute on the West Coast that some of you know that there's still conversations are going on at the patent office and now it's at the federal circuit talking about who really owns of who should get the CRISPR licenses. Um, that entity, that university licensed the entire CRISPR portfolio exclusively to one company. Mm -hmm. That one company turned around and licensed the agricultural use to Pioneer. So we had a situation where Pioneer had exclusivity to one estate and the rest of the ag field could take non-exclusive licenses from Broad as we've been doing. And we were worried that if it turns out that the other patents are necessary, um, it would create a situation where there's only one player in the ag field that has access to the technology. So we had conversations with... I.e. a monopoly. Yes. Um, now, Pioneer were worried about the opposite. What if what they license exclusively is not is useless because right. what they need is the broad IP. So they came ask and asked for a license because they knew we were given non-exclusive licenses. And we said, we'll be happy to give you a license if you agree to now sub-license your estate non-exclusively to every ag company. Mm. So you can imagine that conversation, how that went initially, but... But you were raised in Tel Aviv, so I'm sure it went well. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, you got it. So, yeah. So what we announced a couple of weeks ago, that they agreed to do that. They will get a license to our technology. In exchange, they agreed to make their technology available to everyone else, and there's template licenses, and people can come, and many have already to request the joint license. So, Emily, is it healthy to have that much deal-making around something that's coming <laughs> as a result of really academic base or some government support, innovation, and research? I mean, I just wonder, should we all be worried? Mm -hmm. Are you worried? after you hear this story. I mean, he, he's telling the story of saving the day, but I, I can imagine a lot of cases where it's not yeah, that. And we're talking yeah. about the cutting edge of the next generation of science and really changing uh, what's possible in ag, right, and in, in production. Are you worried? Yes or no? Well, I'm worried about something maybe different from what okay. you're worried about, or I don't know what you're worried about. We're gonna but get you, Bob, I, I think there's, yeah, there's a yeah. piece of it that is this question about you know, the patent holders and what right. and, and how they're controlling that and whether they're sharing it. And it's been heartening to hear this, the, you know, this opportunity to not have exclusive licensing, make it open, allow people to use this technology in the agricultural space. Mm -hmm. And what I worry again about is just then more and more, this, this technology is in the hands of more and more people, right. which is great for the experimentation, but then the lack of regulation actually worries me even more because it becomes very cheap mm -hmm. and very easy. And we heard earlier about um, making jellyfish with legs, and I have no strong feelings about jellyfish, but, um, but it does start to, I have to, no you know, problem with jellyfish with legs. <laughs> uh, uh. As long as they're not coming after me, I'm okay with it. But, um, but, you know, it does get into these questions of who's calling the shots then on um, this this technology that's right. now a lot more inexpensive than it ever was. Thank you. So Bob, we've we've talked a little bit about what's going on in, in, in you know CRISPR innovation, gene editing, you know these kinds of things. We have the legal framework being doubted and debated, and you're now responsible for taking food to the world. You know coming out of this mess, and and you're I know you're an AID contractor. You work a lot, uh, as you were saying, in trying to help um, areas of the world that are that are working off 2,000 year old technology and help help them jump ahead. And so maybe give us a quick snapshot of that. But I, I just want to put in a context that you, you're you taking technology that's evolving out of this and help help taking it abroad. And I'm interested in how you see the ethical uh, dimensions of that. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. And I'm happy to be between my lawyer and my scientist here. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm, I'm in good, good company. You actually feed people. Uh, well, we try. People. I mean, as you said, the, the technology in use by, let's say, half a billion farmers in the base of the pyramid, the, 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 the most less developed countries, uh, who feed probably uh, three to four billion people worldwide, um, is, is is need, in need of an upgrade. And so accessing that and getting it out to these, uh, to these people, um, the access issue is really the issue. It's not more um, as far as licensing or, or producing it. It's there, it exists. So when you can do that and when you can double or triple incomes um, from a dollar a day to three dollars a day, you have an amazing impact on people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And so we're working uh, through a U.S. government-funded uh, program to what we call deleverage the investment that companies need to make to, to move technologies into these marketplaces. They're very high costs in, 
in uh, setting up uh, the marketing team to demonstrate this, show people how it works. There are no extension systems in these countries, so how do they learn about these products if it isn't for somebody out there trying to sell them? Um, so this is, this is something that we're trying to do. We're working with the private sector to do it. Uh, we're trying to leverage. This is something that came out of the Obama administration, the Feed the Future program. Well, see, I was going to kind of keep that quiet because I didn't yeah. want to. I mean, how much, how much are you funded at? Um, Your we, government? We have, uh, we have about a $50 million fund, um, yeah. and it's been fully funded. And actually, to, to their credit, I think uh, Congress is really supportive of this idea. Um, they believe that food security means national security, mm -hmm. it's, as well as it being the right thing for Americans to do. We have resources to do this. We have know-how to do this. And it actually helps us build markets so for So the current for Congress, uh, GOP controlled, is as committed to what you're doing and funding and supporting this message of, of, of smart ag abroad that, they as it was before. They are absolutely as supportive, which is, which is great news, I think, for, for people in this line of business. Let me ask you another bit about the ethical side of this. And, you know, not that I'm an, any expert on this, but one of the things I have heard about the tension points about our engagement on the ag front with a place like Africa mm -hmm. um, is that you're on the technology side, but there are others that are in the food aid and food provision side. So right. one of the things that people are out there trying to do in Africa is get markets going. And you know, a, a French development guy said, look, if you want to really move the needle on, on understanding what you have to do, you have to help the woman farmer in Congo trying to raise cotton, get into the global market and not be wiped out, or mm -hmm. any other staple or product in there. And what they often find is you get, you know, markets going, you bring in technology, you get it going, and then there's some uh, act that leads to a massive amount of U.S. food aid. And that food is dumped into the system and blows out the market. And it raises an interesting question about, about ethics mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how you create sustainability and increase in productivity in these areas when uh, you can have a tsunami of competitive free product that, that's paid for by the U.S. government right. that comes in. Have you ever dealt with that? We have, actually, uh, dealt directly with it. And um, it is an issue. Um, I think that the whole idea of food aid makes sense in places that lack food. Um, as, as organizations that do this as, as, a, as part of their business, the World Food Program specifically, they recognize this and they, are, they have a commitment to buy more food locally um, and redistribute it. The distribution is often the problem. There's an area of one country that lacks food a, a certain season and another area which may have a surplus, and there's the Congo River in between. So how do you, how do you move it from one place to the other? Um, World, food Pro, uh, World Food Program is actually working on that issue. Um, I think the U.S. government really tries not to flood markets that are in surplus. Mm -hmm. they, they have something called the Bellman analysis that that actually um, looks at markets before they dump food. Right. And if they're sufficiently... So there's awareness of the... There of is, the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you, the, 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 today, and the, to all three of you, I, I was, had the privilege of moderating a session on vaccines and vaccine science and where we're going. And it's, it's similar to this conversation. Amazing new possibilities. But one of the interesting things, there was an amazing imam from Minnesota uh, uh, and the head of the Department of Health in Minnesota that were responding to an outbreak in measles, 79 cases of measles earlier this year, um, because they had been led uh, to believe that vaccinations were bad. And so it raises an interesting question of embrace of science or rejection of science for whatever reasons. And, and in this particular case, bad things happened. Uh, and this imam tried to culturally bring the Somali uh, 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 population back in it. Very moving story. But it's an interesting question about GMOs, because all of the scientists that we talked about today, you know, in food, and I said, well, tell me more so we can uh, bring this to this forum in Boston, that, that is there a tension between uh, the GMO world, the organic world, the, uh, uh, I was out visiting Hampton Creek recently, the, the, the folks that want to make hamburgers out of plants, mm -hmm. and, and but, but a lot of it is, is it, is it love of science? Is it rejection of science? Where do you think we're at with that? Um, I think we have to be very careful uh, about uh, how we go about condemning or embracing science. Um, I think GMO is a fantastic example. 
essentially, it's been proven to be very effective. Um, there's certainly a bullseye on Monsanto for using GMOs to promote a, a, uh, an herbicide product that makes them a ton of money. Mm. However, um, these have implications, and it goes back to the access of science. In Africa, only four countries out of 54 allow GMO um, seeds into their country. Mm. So essentially what that does is it really, um, it really scales back the potential for them to produce more food. Um, so, so but, but on the other side, doesn't it assure that they become a haven for future biodiversity and future products that may have been uh, um, I, I, I you know, think wiped out in, in, in I mean, I, I'm sort of interested I, in this. I, I, this think, bio, yeah. I, I think, yeah, maybe, but um, immediately I think what they want to do is put food on their table, make, make a, a livable income, and have meat more than once every wedding or mm. funeral. Um, so so they, they want better nutrition. They, they need to grow more food to, to make that happen, and they need to make more money. And so not allowing GMOs affects that. Right. So, so I just mentioned I, I was at the World Food Prize a couple of weeks ago. It was in Iowa, in Des Moines. And there was a CRISPR panel uh, talking about the potential of CRISPR, and there were a few people that work with not-for-profits are developing crops for African countries to increase yields, to, to provide um, more nutritious food and, and larger amounts of food. And at the end of the panel, the, you, there were people that from developing countries, specifically from Africa, that got up and pleaded that we get the education right. What they were mostly worried about, that, that within their countries, people said, no, 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 we don't want any foods that was CRISPRized. We don't want, we're afraid of it, we don't want to use it. And one after one, there were multiple speakers who got up and speak, can you please get the education right? Can you please get the education right? We want to make sure that we can actually get access to those mm. seeds and those plants. And they were worried that there would be a backlash, probably the same as they have yeah. against the GMO. Yeah. That was the one very clear uh, request from developing countries. And I don't know how we get the education. Mm. <laughs> Emily? <laughs> well, I'll say it's interesting because it's sort of the bringing together of what consumers want and are willing to try or buy right and that you know transparency angle this kind of regulatory questions about what's regulated how and by what agencies what has to go through a different process and then what's good for for industry that wants to be able to innovate um, and i don't think we've gotten it right i really think we did a bad job on the first wave of of genetically engineered you know gmo crops and i'm hoping we can do a better job because there's there's so much potential now. Um, so I think going back earlier, EC was saying something about, you know, the cost of bringing new drugs to market. And I think that, you know, whether we think there's ways we can make that cheaper and quicker, that might be true, but it's because there's really strong regulation. Um, there's a lot more accountability on what you have to do. I think on the food side, we, it's not clear what that is. And um, if there were more of a process where consumers could understand, here's what's going on, there's a way to weigh and there's a way to be educated. Um, and also bringing some of that science into the government agencies too, because mm. I think it's they're struggling with it as well. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the audience soon, but I want to ask you guys something else. Um, I, I, has any, are, are many of you ag people? I hope any of you are ag people. Has anybody ever heard of Chino Farms? Any any Chino Farms people? Yay, one person? Mm -hmm. Cool, a little bit, that's great. So Chino Farms is a 5,000 acre farm. Probably the other farms like it, but it happens to be the one I was at last week uh, mm -hmm. on the eastern shore of Maryland. And about two-thirds of the farms are traditional um, mass ag production, chemicals, all the kinds of things. I think our underwriter would be very uh, uh, into that. And then there was another dimension with, with which our underwriter would all of you do, which is a research. The other third is donated research. There are 91 bird nets, for instance, and so they, they, they tag birds. And then they've got other areas where they're looking at whether or not with, with border um, uh, border ranges and certain kinds of trees or whatnot, can you basically affect what uh, flows into the water, into the Chester River? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess he's been working with MIT, with Harvard, with other places that are in the ag area on a long time, of uh, basically using this working farm part in, in, in uh, a traditional full-based uh, uh, farm that everything is there, and then the other what can we do to do it and what are the costs to farmers? So looking at, you know, what are the cost impacts if you basically take part of your farm out of production, you create these borders, are they effective, are they not? Uh, and, then I, and then I think another um, interesting dimension there is that the person who's actually running the farm, who runs it uh, as a business, um, has moved part of what 
they have under cultivation into organic production because they get so much more price for that uh, in the in the local region in the community and so i'm i'm interested in the question of as we talk about ethics if i were uh, a business conglomerate and were highly unethical and you were a business conglomerate and were highly ethical who would win in the end <laughs> who do i want I mean, to win? And, and maybe maybe, maybe <laughs> that maybe win. that's the wrong question but as i see people struggling like at chino <laughs> farms with harry sears or you see this going on. I'm interested in whether the questions that we're talking about are genuinely real when it comes mm -hmm. to food production, trying to get it right in the future, trying to do this, or are our efforts to think through some of these questions of better practices, ethical practices coming to this, a fig leaf over just, we're gonna keep going the same direction mm -hmm. of, of less biodiversity, more, you know, we, we may, science may drive us into greater and greater efficiencies that may in fact not be the right choice for society in the end. I'm just, mm -hmm. quick, quick thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I understand that concern. I think what's interesting with the new technology is that I think we're gonna end up seeing a lot more experimentation, perhaps than the first wave of genetically um, engineered crops. So I think there's a lot of potential there for change. And I think also we've seen, um, you know, there could be potential as well for things to be more sustainable using our resources more effectively, not just better for companies because they're able right. to sell more of their products, but actually better for nutrition, better for the land, better for the soil. Bob? Yeah, I, I think that farmers basically want to do the right thing. I mean, they own the land and it's their, their major asset, so they don't want to mis, you know, misuse it. I think that you're going to see a, a, a lot better technology coming out. Um, I think there are going to be a lot more, a lot less chemicals applied. There's going to be um, uh, um, gene editing uh, that that can help prevent pest damage. Uh, there's going to be more biological products. Mm. Um, or the organic movement is, you know, well documented, and and I think it's it's um, mm. it's a big market that farmers want to get into. Yeah. Any closing thoughts, Isi? Yes. Um, I, I have to believe, and I do believe, that advancement in science would lead to more ethical practices and more diversity and the ability of more entities to compete. And part of the way they compete should be around the ethics and does the public accept with what they present to them and their business practices, practices or not. Hmm. And if you go from a model where there's one conglomerate or one entity and were their choices, I think ethical behavior should be one of the considerations. And I think regulators have something to do with this. Well, before well. I go to the audience, I just want to remind everyone we did talk about jellyfish with legs, uh, <laughs> if nothing else, and what you can do with CRISPR. But let me open up for you. Yes, hi. We're going to bring you a microphone right here. Oh, yes, okay. hi. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name, oh, you hold it. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Shavella, and I'm from the Food Project. And um, this is just sort of a question that was based off of the last group and sort of coupled with what you've been talking about now. Um, just thinking about us as humans being stewards of the land and us being what we eat, you know, we are what we eat. Um, what, this is a two-part question. How do you think cellular, cellular agriculture is going to rival our now unnatural agricultural system? Um, because it will at one point rival mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, what happens to the regular farmer and how does that economically affect the bottom 80%? And also knowing that academic research is limited and we're just now discovering five years ago that biomes exist and microbiomes exist. At what point is it safe for people to actually eat these um, experiments and thinking that <laughs> we're, you are talking now about products and I feel like we've strayed away from the fact that it's produce. Right. So, you know, how is that, how are you thinking about that ethically that we're now talking about products as opposed to produce when it comes to agriculture? So. Cellular ag and microbiomes, if I can do short form, <laughs> yes. Um, I think there's going to be a niche for it. Um, it depends on consumer acceptance, uh, really. Mm. And, uh, you know, if they can make um, um, meat out of a Petri dish and it tastes really good and it's inexpensive, maybe, maybe I'll go for it, I don't know. <laughs> Will you? Can, can I answer yeah, the second, Emily, yeah, the second question? I think gets to this point of, I think you're right, that you know, how do we make sure these things are safe? Who's the guinea pigs? Are we just putting food out there into the world and saying, oh, people got sick? Uh, that's where I'm worried. That's mm -hmm. where I think we need to do a better job to ensure that there's a regime in place where we're testing these products. We know what, you know, we know what's safe and we know we're putting things out. Um, and I think it's better for industry too. I think right now the uncertainty, I would say, I don't know if this is true in CRISPR. I know it's true in the cellular agriculture space that 
the lack of a, an answer on what agency is going to regulate and how right. means that it's very difficult to actually make progress in any direction. So I think it's going to be better for consumers and better for industry if we get it right on what does that testing look like and who's doing it. Yes, he, any quick thought on that? No, I think you covered that really well. Well, I'm going to uh, bring it there. I, I do want to say in, in response, because you know, sometimes when we're short-forming uh, conversations like this, we, we even I, uh, and particularly I, tend to uh, overstate some things. And we, when, I, when I sort of look at it, I you know, started out as a blogger uh, wanting to take down the Washington Post and New York Times, <laughs> which I saw as homogenized blobs of, 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 of news. And, and when you look at what's going on out there and you're honest about it, it's a much, much more rich a uh, uh, field of farmers and players and producers that that you know I always I think your question is very interesting because it implied are we going to continue going in one direction and the fact is that that innovation can happen you can go down a micro level you see urban farms you see uh, other other unique farms coming in so I just want to make sure that that is noted and in the conversation because I think it would be uh, overstating it to say we're going to end up with only mammoth side production that that, that wipes out uh, certain folks maybe that's a concern but I do I do think it's richer uh, from what I've seen around the country and the world um, than we sometimes give light to. I want to thank uh, everyone here. Thank um, Emily Broadlieb of, of Harvard, the, the uh, Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, uh, Bob Robotsky of the Feed the Future Partnership for Innovation, and Issy Rosen uh, from Harvard and MIT, and uh, as Chief Business Officer, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.